Hi everybody! The greatest goblin that ever lived needs to find a way to get this shit done on time. But I'm here for a comic book review for the week of the 22nd of June 2016, the week of my birthday. <laughs> and that week has now come and gone, and it's time to talk about the books that came out for that week. But let me show you off what let me show off what uh, what Jennifer got for me for my birthday. This lovely uh, vinyl vixen's poison ivy statue. And yeah, you guessed it. This lady ain't never coming out the box. Uh, just that's just beautiful. And it looks like it comes with this green star-like stand that I can stand her on. Uh, but yeah, more than likely she ain't coming out the box. This is just a beautiful figure, and, and my lady knows me very well. She knows I just adore Poison Ivy, so yeah. And coincidentally, I got her a Harley Quinn out of this line too, so now we have a Harley and Ivy. And she's just going to sit right there like a good girl while I talk about some comic books. Uh, I got one catch-up, and uh... The rest are all uh, current. Got only I got one catch up for Marvel and two for this week. Two Marvel and a lot of DC and some Indies. So we're gonna start with the back order, with the back issue. I I had read this, and just like everybody else, I freaked. I was like, "What the hell is this?" And I was like, oh no, nah, this, this can't be right. But after watching my bro, the Mount Vernon Kid, review this book, I decided, what the hell, I'm going to see where they go with this. Because it's a monumental moment in comic book history. It'll be remembered for quite a long time. Maybe not entirely positively, but... I'm ready to see where they go, and luckily, Arkham Comics here just had one more had one more copy of this. So I went ahead and got it, and I put this on my poll because I'm genuinely intrigued on where they go with it. And we're talking about Steve Rogers, Captain America number one. I got the action figure variant. This was this was the only copy we had left, and uh, yeah. Everybody knows what's going on here, and it, the, the the term Captain Hydra has been spewed out all over the internet. And he, okay, yeah, you know Captain America, seemingly now being an agent of Hydra. I, I read this book, and it was good. The storytelling was great, and I love Steve's new shield. I love the the heat blade on the bottom of it. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, I like that they're bringing back some uh, some classic characters from the 90s that I thought really did very well. Um, but yeah, seeing Steve throw poor Jack off the air off the aircraft and he says "Hail Hydra" at the end, I'm think my first thought was bullshit, and then I I, I I was raging about it. I'll admit it, but now I'm I'm intrigued where they can go with this because either they're going to fix this with either, or explain this, excuse me. They're going to explain this as either A, time travel, or B, the fucking cosmic cube shit. Uh, but I thought, thought it was a good issue. And yes, that, that cliffhanger at the end with him saying Hail Hydra, that'll be a moment that will be remembered for years to come. If I had to rate this book, I would give it a four. But now on to the current books. We'll start with Marvel. We're gonna start with Gwenpool number three. Hastings and uh, Gurihiru. I hope I didn't butcher those names. Uh, but this is a yeah. I can still see where people draw the comparison from Gwenpool and Harley Quinn. And let's just be honest: the Harley Quinn is a million times better. Gwenpool couldn't even lace Harley's shoes. Um, but Gwenpool is a cute character. You know, she's, she's in a bit of a pickle because Batroc the Leaper has figured out that she's not from this universe. She's from the real world. And massive amounts of fourth wall breaking like you would expect in a Deadpool comic. But remember, 
This is Deadpool with tits and pussy. Even though they've already done that, they're doing it again with a separate character, and she just happens to be called Gwen. And no, this is not Gwen Stacy. Her name is Gwen Poole. P-O-O-L-E. That is her name. It is not Gwen Stacy. I thought that too. Uh, but... Yeah, she gets some unexpected help from a certain someone, and that is Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange comes along to help her out with her problem, because without any proper identifications or any, you know, actual records of her, she can't, she can't get paid to do what she does. And Doctor Strange finds a way to help her out. I'll, I'll spoil that. He finds a way to help her. And she's overjoyed about it, but at the same time, this could come back to bite her in the ass with, with MODOK. A good issue. It was fun. It was cute. It was silly. I'll take it for what it is and give it a three. All right, moving on to The Mighty Thor, number eight. Jason Aaron. Fucking awesome writing. I mean, I love this character. You know, even though I grew up with Thor Odinson, Jane Foster is doing a fine job as the goddess of thunder. It's just really, really cool. And man, I'm, I'm reminded of just how big a dickwad some S.H.I.E.L.D. agents can be. You know, they just, they just flat out take Jane and basically order her to come with them and then they start interrogating her and actually threatening her for information about Thor and Jane just laughs it off saying, hey, I'm dying of cancer. What can you dickheads threaten me with? You know. And I thought, like, there you go. That was great. That was a great moment. I really liked that. And uh, but somebody else working with Shield, I'm not going to ruin everything. But you know, somebody comes along, you know, and bails her out of the situation, and and then we see Jane swooping back into action as the goddess of thunder and everything. It was this was just a, a fun issue. It was really well done. Uh, we got some real badasses you know taking place in a secret meeting it's like they call it I believe uh, one of them said they are like one percent of the one percent and some big names in here big names Tiberius Stone from Alchemax Wilson Fisk is there uh, Silver Samurai Jr. and of course uh, the head of Roxon himself uh, douchebag X douchebag asshole he shares initials with that <laughs> and, um, but yeah, and a big move happens in, in, in that little meeting. Uh, this was just a really fun, very well done issue. I really liked it. Uh, was it on par with some of the stuff we've been reading earlier in the series? Not really, but it was good for what it was. I'll give it a 3.5. Moving on to the indie stuff, we start with we're going to IDW with Back to the Future number 9. This is part 4 of Continuum Con Conundrum. In here, Marty and Doc decide to travel to the year 2035. Uh, yeesh. Uh, all kinds of stuff is going on in here. You know, instead of roller derby, there's fly derby. They're all on hoverboards or what hoverboards are in this time period because apparently hoverboard is even retro in this time period. And instead of the Club 80s, it's Club 2015 and, you know, it's like, remember the good old days when everybody liked Justin Bieber and all that other bullshit? <laughs> oh, fuck me. Uh, yeah, it's like, uh, and uh, Doc, I'll go ahead and spoil this. Doc gets his full memories back in this issue, and all kinds of crazy shit happens, and they're being pursued by a cop, and I dare not ruin who it is. Oh, my fucking God. Of all people to be a fucking cop in Hill Valley, Jesus Christ, just really, really cool. Um, but a fun issue, very fun, very well done. Um, not the best shit in the world, but it's good. It feels like it, this felt like Back to the Future stuff. This this is one of the stronger issues of the series, but it, it, it had its flaws, but it's still very well done. Um, yeah, I'll give it a three point five. Staying with IDW with Bebop and Rocksteady Destroy Everything, number four. Ooh, God, all kinds of people worked on this. The artwork continues to change page after page after page after page. Some of the artwork in here is great. Some of it, not so great. I don't, there was a lot of artwork in here that I quite honestly did not like. 
but the writing is still really good. I mean, Bebop and Rocksteady, there's they're badasses in in the comics, but there's still some of that slapstick slapsticky silliness that comes with these characters. And we even get a glimpse of the Bebop and Rocksteady from the 80s cartoon series. That particular look and that particular character design. We get a little peek of the 80s Bebop and Rocksteady. Uh, all kinds of crazy shit's going on. There's fatalities in here. There's all kinds of cross time streaming. It's like every time they time jump, they create new alternate realities. and. and it's just become one big ginormous time stream cluster fuck. And that's all this issue is. It's focusing solely on Bebop and Rocksteady. The turtles don't show up until the very last page of the book. And it's just to focus on how much fucking up Bebop and Rocksteady are doing. It's just really silly. Sometimes it can be a little bit hard to follow because of the constant shifts in artwork, but it's still good for what it is. I'll give it a 3.5. Alright, series I really wish wasn't ending on this, but Red Sonia number 6. This is the end of Marjorie Bennett's run on the title, and I really wish this was an, on, uh, an ongoing instead of a miniseries. But given what Marjorie Bennett was given to work with, she did a great job. I mean, I mean, Marjorie Bennett is doing a good job with writing. She's doing good with Red Sonia. She does good with insects. Uh, I mean, a lot of the stuff that she's been writing here lately, I've just been loving it. And this is one of the, this is one of the really good ones. And you know, Sonia finds a way to deal with King Savine and everything. You know, takes back her homeland. Uh, but man, th this this issue was violent. This issue was very highly action packed. Nothing, nothing really gory happens in here, and you know, it, it, but I mean, this was heavy, heavy on the action and the drama. The drama in here was really good, and there was a tease that Sonya and a particular someone were actually falling in love with each other. There was a possibility, and it's a woman. You know, it's that little, that little playwright in the blue dress that Sonya had befriended in this series. There was teases and implications that. Her and Sonya were actually falling for one another, and I was like, I'm like, yeah, I wish, I wish this series could have gone on a little further and see what Miss Bennett could do with that. She's really good at writing same-sex couples, especially uh, the female same-sex couples. Not in a pornographic way, you know. There, it's implied, you know, it's shown in insects how how raunchy she can get, but she can write it. Miss Bennett can write a, a, a couple like that and make it believable, just like Gail Simone could. Uh, it's just really, really good stuff. Um, it's just a shame it ended so abruptly. I would, I just would have liked to have seen this story drag out just a little bit more. But given what Miss Bennett was given to work with, she did a good job for the most part. And the conclusion was fine. I'll give it a 3.5. On to the pick of the week, folks. Pick of the week goes to Boom Studios, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers number four. Holy shit! Kyle Higgins, Henry Prasetto, uh, and Matt Herms. I'm sorry if I butchered those names, but oh my god! The stuff is fantastic. I mean, and here, when I started this series, I, I was thinking this was going to be cheeseball goofiness that I would get a cheap laugh out of. No, this is good. This is really good. This is one of the best comics going on the shelves, period. And lo and behold, there's actually some fucking logic in these Power Rangers stories. You know, Scorpina and Rita created a phony dragon dagger with a green crystal full of chaos energy to seize control of the dragon sword. So, so what does what does Tommy do? Fuck it. Morph, jump in there and fight Scorpion and try to regain control of the dragon sword. Although he does do it against Jason's command. And I, I, like, the, I like the fact that Jason is given a more serious re, uh, representation as a leader. You know, what he says goes. And, you know, and Jason flat out orders him to stay in the command center until he gets his powers readjusted until he can join the fight. Because Tommy's powers are all out of whack. His power readings are going way off the scale. 
and you know the, the, the existence of this green chaos crystal is not really helping anything. And you know, and Tommy decides he wants to morph and join the join the fray. We finally get to see Megazord in here. We finally get Megazord in here, and oh my god, he looks fucking awesome. And uh, you know, Tommy decides he wants to morph, and Zordon tells him, "You're going against a direct order from your leader." And I was like, "Okay, I like that." A more of an emphasis on Jason's leadership. But Tommy's like, I'm sorry, but I gotta try. And he morphs and he tries to steal control back of the Dragon Zord. They end up winning the day. I'm not gonna ruin how. But then the Rangers start bickering. I like the fact that even though they won the battle, there's still tension amongst them. They're not all huggy, huggy, buddy, buddy. Oh, that's great. We're finally free of that. Like, no. And instead of destroying Scorpina, they capture her and take her to the command center for what looks like interrogation and there's this crystal going on and I will say one thing here right now Zach in this issue he is a complete king size douchebag in this issue the shit he says it just doesn't it's just not with character but it also helps add to the drama because they start bickering at each other, and this crystal that Scorpina had fused with this phony dragon dagger starts glowing more radiant. And the... Oh, I can't... I can't ruin the ending. I can't ruin that cliffhanger. I feel like I've already ruined a little too much, but Jesus Christ, the ending of this issue was, fun. dare I say, more phenomenal. Fucking awesome issue. I loved it, and I'm like, God damn, this is good stuff. This was easily the pick of the week for me. I'll give it a 4.5. Moving on to DC with Aquaman number one. Again, another number one. Dan Amnett, Brad Walker. Uh, good storytelling. Um, Walker's artwork for me in this issue was kind of hit and miss. I there were times he there were times the artwork makes Arthur and Mira look a little older than I think they should be in here. But still, Mira. <sighs> but uh, yeah, uh, the writing is still very solid, very well done. You know, Arthur and Mira, you know, have come to an understanding that it is time to unite the surface world and Atlantis, you know, together. And they're trying their damnedest to make sure it happens. But then something comes, something happens. I'll go ahead and spoil this. Black Manda shows up. I'm not going to spoil how he shows up, and I'm not going to spoil what he does when he gets there, but oh man, does he find a way to fuck up Arthur and Mara's plan. I'm just not going to reveal how he does it, because oh shit, is it good. Very, very nicely done. The artwork, like I said, hit and miss, but the writing is still solid as ever. It's just really, really well done. Uh, it gets an easy four for me despite the artwork. Moving on to Cyborg number 12. This is going to be a series that's going to be reset back to number one because of the whole rebirth thing and I really honestly feel like it's not needed. Uh, but I'm not going to do what I do for Spider-Man and try to stick with traditional numbering. I'm only, going to I'm only going to try that with titles like Spider-Man and Uncanny X-Men or whatever the fuck else I feel like. But Marv Wolfman still writing this is just really good. Uh, Cyborg is finally freed from his little pod that they, they were putting him in for examination. And he comes across two people who were believed to be royally screwed over by Star Labs. They have very unique abilities, but there's a reason for it, and there's a reason why they are, you know, reluctant to ask for help. You know, at, at times they just flat out act like they don't want any help. You know, one of them is desperate for it, one of them doesn't want it, and it's just just drama upon action upon tension. It's just really good stuff. I mean, Marv Wolfman's writing clearly shines in here because it took me back to yesteryear, you know, when he did stories like this in the 80s. And it, it's just, Mr. Wolfman just hasn't lost a step when it comes to writing such a good character that he created. And it's just really fun it's just really good I'm not gonna say it was fun because there was hardly any fun in this book at all uh, it was dead serious and very 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 uh, bittersweet 
uh, ending to, uh, to the issue. Uh, good stuff, though. Uh, Marv Wolfman does a great job with this. Uh, I'll give it a four. Maybe I'm just maybe I'm a little too generous with that title since I'm an '80s brat, and I I always have a special place in my heart for Marv Wolfman and George Perez and the New Teen Titans. It was my first comic book series. Going on to Detective Comics number 935. And uh, notice the logo on the on the cover. Yeah, they went back to the uh, to the previous logo that they had, that they were using before the New 52 started. Which I'm digging that. I actually like this logo better than the New 52 logo. Uh, yeah, Detective Comics. Oh yeah. But all, first thing I, I want to repeat myself. It's good to see Batwoman shining again. Batwoman looks awesome in this book. Not just art-wise, but I'm talking about character development-wise. She was just very well done. James Denon IV is uh, doing a great job with the writing. Barrow's artwork is still good. It's uh, the the team of the the Batmen. You know, Red Robin, St uh, Spoiler, Orphan, Clayface. You know, they're trying they're trying their best to impress Batwoman. You know, and work work well for Batman, but there's some animosity there. There's some mixed feelings, mixed emotions there. Uh, I like the little scene with uh, Tim and Stephanie. I thought that was pretty well done. I, I love the interaction between Bruce and Tim. I thought that was very nicely well touched upon. You know, Batman's telling him, "It's like you never officially declared yourself a Robin. You wanted to distance yourself from that, but for me, you were Robin. You were a Robin to me." It's like he just flat out blurts that out and just lets it go, and it's just wow. You know, I still don't get why Tim, why DC has all of a sudden changed Tim's origins around and decided he was never a Robin. I mean, that's just, it's still kind of insulting to me. But, you know, he was a Robin, goddammit! Uh, but still very, very nicely done. Uh, dealt in the, that that oh that cliffhanger shit <laughs> woo nice book really well put together a uh, three point five let's keep it going with Flash number one <sighs> Williamson great great writing uh, the artwork it's kind of it's like Aquaman it's kind of eh for me but this felt like a honest to god Flash comic, you know, where, you know, Barry's still trying to balance his life as Barry Allen and the Flash, and you really feel his emotions when you're reading what kind of shit he's trying to deal with. It's like he's trying to juggle a set of balls with only like one hand, and it's only gonna it's only gonna blow up in his face. Uh, but yeah, uh, not too much happens in here except for the end of the book. The end of the book was the show stealer uh, with uh, mm, I can't even I can't even spoil it. It, it was good and uh, it's planting the seeds for what's coming up in this particular run for the flash. Uh, look a minor spoiler. It looks like we're gonna get yet another speedster. I've already seen his costume in future solicitations and advertisements. And I already know his name. His name is going to be Godspeed. He looks cool, and I like the name. But this right here is where we're planting the seeds of what's going to be building up to that, and I thought DC did a good job with it. The artwork was kind of eh, but the writing was still solid. I really I really enjoyed it. Uh, give it a 3.5. <sighs> Harley Quinn, number 29. Uh, well, Connor Palmiani, and uh, it's good to see Chad Harden back on the uh, interior artwork. But I, I ain't gonna lie, this this issue was just too fucking silly. I know Harley Quinn's supposed to mo mostly, for the most part, be a silly, fun comic book, but I, this was this was too silly. It was so silly it wasn't funny. Yeah, you, know, you basically got Harley Quinn controlling a fucking Gundam suit and. The, the, the bathroom humor in here, it just didn't work for me. I didn't really like it. The only thing in this issue at all that I actually liked was the scene between Harley and Ivy. They look like a legit couple. 
a legit romantic couple. And I wish DC would just quit with the... They, they, they pretty much stated that their relationship is canon. Okay, I get it. That, that's fine. But I wish they would just blow the lid off the whole thing and just make it truly 100% legit. Because their chemistry, it just really works. And that was the only scene in the book that I actually enjoyed. The rest of the stuff, it's just... It was so silly. It was to the point of doing this a lot. And I'm like, what the fuck am I reading? Um... Yeah, I think Connor and Palmiotti uh, got a little too much leeway with this issue, and it, it just, a lot of the comedy, it just didn't work for me. Um, I'll, but I'll be, I'll be nice and give it a three. We're ending this with Wonder Woman number one, Greg Rucka, Liam Sharp. Oh my god. If Power Rangers didn't come out for this particular week of books, this would have made Pick of the Week. This was incredible. Greg Rucka's writing on this title is just fantastic. We're seeing all the characters coming back. We got, we got, of course, Diana. We got Steve. We got Etta Candy coming back. It's good to see Etta Candy again. Uh, you know, she, Etta's talking to Steve through communication. You know, Steve's on a mission somewhere in another land, while Diana's in a jungle trying to find out more answers about her past. What, what is the truth of her life? And this is, you know, this is part one of the of the lies storyline and it's gonna the 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 cliffhanger fuck that oh god that cliffhanger oh god i i can't ruin it jesus that cliffhanger that was like a peter it was almost a peter david ish kind of cliffhanger fucking amazing uh unfortunately the next part of this particular storyline continues in issue three Whereas in issue two, we're starting a separate storyline called Year One. P year Part one of the Year One storyline starts at issue two, and the next part starts at issue four. So for the Lie storyline, it's issues one and three, and for Year One, it's issues two and four. They're going to alternate, since this book is being shipped twice a month, they're going to alternate issues with storylines. I can be alright with that. Um, I'd like to see how they can do that, but uh, it was a great, a great new beginning for Diana. I'm intrigued as fuck. I want to know what's going on. Awesome. Great beginning to the series. An easy four. Well, that's all I got for this week, everybody. I want to thank you all for watching. Uh, th uh, and thanks again to everybody who wished me a happy birthday. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. Check out uh, Arkham Asylum Studio, again, if you want to see the, the Money in the Bank review. We're going to be doing a lot of wrestling pay-per-view reviews on there. Speaking of wrestling, I do re I'm do. i going to do some wrestling talk on my Blue Goblin X channel, as well as Midtown Comic Stashes. Or you can just stick with me here. You can find me here on YouTube or on Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter, Pinterest, wherever you want to find me. I'm sure you'll find me. <laughs> and uh, you all know about the shout-outs in the description below. Thanks for watching, everybody. I am Groot. I'll see y'all later.